subscribe so we get exclusive. And so it's the same here tonight. We all love human tragedy, don't we? And that's what this story is about. Um, firstly, I have given you a handout on the bibliography about Robert Kenai. And it's, it's fascinating to me as a historian and as a director of the Human Museum that most of the visitors who come to our place who are from Nebraska uh, know this story or some version of the story. And then the people that are coming from Chicago, Denver, New York, or up in Long Lincoln don't know that story and know about Robert Enron's art. So it's always very interesting. And these lists of books mainly deal with the artistic career of Robert Henry. And the one book that we're gonna come back to tonight <clears throat> on a couple different occasions is uh, Son of the Gambling Man by Barry Sandoz, because that's how most of you, I'm sure, have heard about the story. And as you'll see in a few moments, there's a lot of inaccuracies in that book that's gotten pushed down, and pushed over uh, during the years. But these are the major works on Robert Henry. And if you decide you want to um, read more about him, I would say the book by William Homer or the book by Bernard Coon. And I don't know, Lori, if you have, you have both those here. So if you're interested, those are the books to read. And if you're interested in the eight, which was a group of artists that Henry was associated with, uh, they're listed as well. Uh, there is a Henry Robert. Uh, dot org website that's not ours ours is the one just underneath it uh, and there's been we have a library full of books about him about his uh, exhibits and about his colleagues so um, he was we're here tonight to talk with this chapter that most of us know or have heard about but most people if you were to talk about robert and i would, would know something about his time in nebraska but not not so much and then I also gave to you a little um, flyer for a book that's coming out later this year that we've written uh, that will talk about not only the, the murder in a little bit more deep or the shooting in a little bit more detail, um, but also Robert Henry Kozak, he would have been known here at this time here uh, in Nebraska. Okay. Um, we at the museum are always, we have a, a thousands of visitors every year. and. I, it's fascinating to me, the ones that are not from Nebraska don't know the story. And when I tell them the story, they're fascinated by it. And Marlene, our president who's sitting here with and I were at a conference a few months ago, and the it was a dean of UNL's uh, art program was here to try to, to talk up doing some partnerships. And I just mentioned in passing that I was a director of the museum and because he said, oh, I thought, you know, Robert Kozad was a different person. I was explaining to him all this, and he took up 10 minutes of our time because he was so fascinated by this story, as I'm sure um, you will be. And it is, as I entitle my program, a moment in our community's history that really um, changed both the lives of the Pearson family and, of course, of the Kozad family. So, to understand the story, there's a bigger story than just John Kozak shooting uh, Al Pearson. And to understand this, I think you need to have some context of what happened and why. And the first piece of this context is the fact that uh, Nebraska and the Great Plains uh, from Canada to Mexico are unforgiving places. Um, farming and ranching are the main ways of life and uh, the, there's always challenges um, to be met. And for the people who came here uh, to Nebraska beginning in the 1840s, <clears throat> and certainly by the time the 1870s when the Kozads come here, uh, this was certainly uh, the case. Uh, only the really toughest could survive to make it in a place like Kozad or out here on the plains. And um, that is very obvious when you begin to look at homesteading records and and you think that most of the homesteaders stayed here, but that's not the case. I think 30, 40, 50% went back actually after getting the time. Um, it's a violent place, it's a challenging place, lots of guns, saloons, gambling, prostitutes, um, 
an example of that. Uh, in 1878, two homesteaders were accused of stealing cattle. Uh, they were ultimately shot, lynched, and burned in a tree in Calaway. Um, it was a horrific incident that spread across the Eastern uh, newspapers. So it is a tough place to, to live in and make a living at. And our two antagonists uh, come from very different worlds. Uh, Alf Pearson, who's pictured on the left, hardworking rancher, modest means. He's born in 1832. He's originally from Indiana and was the son of a Quaker farmer, uh, one of seven children. And I mentioned this Quaker business because I think it's a piece of the Alf Pearson story that's not often mentioned. But if you were a Quaker, you know, Quakers are pacifists, very, very uh, unusual in the sense that um, they have a very different way of looking uh, at life because of that. And that plays into this story, and I think more so than what has been generally given credit. He marries Rachel Harriet Leonard. She was a Presbyterian. Uh, they marry in 1852, and since he had married outside of the Quaker faith, uh, tradition. He had to leave that behind because it's just like the Amish. You pick any of those kind of religious organizations that are close, um, and that is what happens. In the case of Alf Pearson, uh, he had to leave his Quaker faith. And together they have six children Liam Malin, Albert, Laura May, and Francis. And it's believed that Alf Pearson got here to Dawson County alone sometime between 1871-1874. Uh, most of his family then arrived in 77 and 78. Um, his son William came pretty close to his time getting here. He figures into the story later on. And the remainder of the Al Pearson's family uh, stayed in Indiana. Some of them moved to the railroad and uh, other things. But because of the high price of land in Indiana, uh, Pearson decided to homestead here in Nebraska, which was a very common a dream of people. And he homesteaded about six miles north of Montrose. Built a three room sod house in 1850 after a house that he had built two years before burned to the ground. Um, he, sh he owned 80 acres. Uh, he had a 14 by 39 foot sod house, had a windmill and a pump granary, a hog pen, chicken coop, and on his farm he had planted a hundred trees in addition to fruit trees. He was appointed the county's uh, special constable and was his first recorded action, which he was involved with the constable, uh, brought him in 1874 in contact with uh, that position and the problems that that would bring to him on. Um, I suspect, I don't know this, but this is my strong belief, I think, that many residents like Al Pearson over time began to uh, got tired and resentful of uh, John Kozad and his haughty manner and his legal troubles that I'm sure Al Pearson has gone into as well. In writing my book about this, one of the things that I found out is that uh, there was some belief that Al Pearson and John Kozad actually knew each other. Uh, back in Indiana. I don't think that's true. It just lived too far apart. And this is the best story, I think, of all of them, is that Al had a romantic interest in Teresa Kozad, and that that created some bad feelings, although I don't think that's a possibility either. Uh, Teresa Kozad, as you'll see, uh, is this very, um, as we would say back east, a classy dame. And uh, so I don't think that was ever in part, but that's one of the, those are the two of the traditions that come down to this. Uh, then we have John Kozak. John Jackson Kozak, born in 1830. Uh, his wife, Teresa, born in 1837. Uh, they get married in Virginia, uh, later West Virginia. Uh, and uh, they lived in Cincinnati, Ohio, originally, then created a town called Kozakdale, Ohio. And they are the parents of actually five children, only two of which grew to maturity, uh, Johnny Kozad and Robert uh, Kozad. And both of those sons became prominent in their chosen fields. All those other children died in Kozad Dale, all of them were buried uh, in Cincinnati. 
John Kozad, for his part, is described as being loving, haughty, had a violent temper, arrogant, uh, generous, leader, professional card player, husband, selfish, cruel, assassin, killer, loner, and close friend. So if you wonder why at the end of a 500 page book, I can't tell you what I really think of Dr. John Kozak, that's why. <laughs> um, we have a number of books at the museum and, and original documents that will give you both sides of those uh, impressions. But after all this time, having spent three or four years now on this, I still cannot decide whether I like the guy or don't like the guy. Um, he was a professional gambler, and gambling in the 1860s and 70s was not a unseemly uh, career as we might think of it today. Um, it was a, a game of gentlemen that they played it. It was not a bad thing. The places where that was done, bar saloons, prostitutes, all that, well, that gave it some of the bad name. But there were major gambling centers across America, and he went to many of those. Um, in 1872, he's waiting for a train to switch in Omaha. And uh, as he's waiting for the train, he plays a game of Pharaoh, which is what he was very good at. And he won $50,000 in a bet. And just to give you what that's worth today, it'd be worth a million dollars today. Um, it's also known that he one time went over to Denver and won $9,000. So he was very, very good at this game. He was thrown out of many of these gambling houses because he broke the houses. Um, and his wealth was dependent upon uh, this gambling. Um, whenever he ran short of money, he would go back to Chicago, New York, Saratoga, Atlantic City, New Jersey, and gamble and come home with uh, all kinds of cash. He's an ambitious man. Uh, he creates two towns, Cozadel, Ohio, and our town here. There's also some thought that he created a town in South America. I've never found that anywhere, but that's one more of the things. He owned businesses in Cozad, South Dakota, Denver, uh, Ohio, and ultimately in Atlantic City. And he had a mine uh, in uh, Leadville in Colorado. Um, he was about six feet in height, weighed about 185 pounds. He and uh, Al Pearson are about the same uh, size. And uh, he was, in, he, as Pearson was, in, in really vigorous health. And as for Teresa Cozad, John Splake, always beautifully dressed. And um, I can't imagine, and a very, as I said before, a classy lady. I can't imagine what happened when she got to Willow Island and there was nothing there. I mean, absolutely nothing, just, just the prairie. Um, so that's our two antagonists in the story. <coughs> so this is the side of John Kozak's generosity. He decides to build a bridge across the Platte River. This is the, these are some of the remains of that bridge. Some of those pools there are probably uh, from the Cozad Bridge. Um, and you might argue that he did that because he, he most of his land holdings were in the south of the plant and he wanted to connect them to Cozad so he could make more money. Um, but I think he also saw that the future of Cozad <clears throat> and the surrounding, <clears throat> excuse me, surrounding region were they needed a bridge. And there was one in Lexington already built at that point. And so uh, he and that's where everybody south of Cozad on the other side of the flat um, was going to Lexington to do business. So it was important to him to uh, have this bridge built. But among the people who worked on that bridge was Al Pearson and David Claypool and Sam School, two of the big names here in our city's history, um, also uh, worked on the bridge. And the next time you go across the bridge down to Eustace, what happened is John Coase had tried to narrow the channel of the river. So, and there would have been three channels and he tried to narrow them so that he could build a bridge across it. But as I say, Al Pearson worked there and as you'll see in a little bit, this comes back into the uh, story. Another piece of the story to give it context is <clears throat> there was from the very beginning uh, controversies between the cattlemen 
and the, and the homesteads. The reason that is, is that the cattlemen were coming in from Texas, going north to the Lake River and the areas beyond that. And as the homesteaders began to put up fences, began to close their properties off, um, that, that you could see could create uh, conflicts. So another part of the story is that John Kozad owned maybe 5,000 acres of grass south of the South Platte. And there was some thought that maybe some of Pearson's cattle had crossed over onto Kozad's land and eaten some of his grasses. So some that's where the two areas of speculation kind of focus as to what happened uh, between the two of them. So just a block west of the museum, Julia Gatewood, now this would be Teresa Gatewood's name, owned a store called The Beehive. And that's a picture of it circled there. Thank you to Mike Marshall, who gave me these pictures on the downtown Kozad there. But that building circled in red is The Beehive. And at that moment, now we're talking about 1870s, early 80s, most of downtown those that were built with wood frame buildings. Today they're all brick, <clears throat> excuse me, or concrete, but in those days they were all wood frame buildings, very typical of a Western frontier town. That building is no longer there, but the theater, the Fox Theater, is to the right in this picture. So uh, this this photograph is actually after 1906, but this is what it would have, what the beehive uh, would have looked like. And the picture on the bottom shows you what the downtown of uh, uh, those that were. So in 1881, the Kozads leave here and go to Denver, Colorado. They had hay business there, they were shipping hay to, they had the, the, a mine there in Leadville, and they had focused their efforts now from Kozad, Nebraska to Denver, Colorado. And it was on one of the trips back when Kozad came back and forth uh, that he came to Kozad to take care of some business. Alf Pearson, on that day that that happened, it was an October day, um, heard that Kozad was in town and was uh, anxious to speak to him. Some people say, uh, with different versions, say that he was furiously mad and wanted to uh, deal with Kozad because he owed him money. And we know what happened because 12 years later, there was a grand jury that exonerated John Kozad, but all of these pieces of the story come into the grand jury uh, testimony. Um, and you can even read that testimony today, and you can, I would say, come to a pretty definitive conclusion as to what happened. Although members of the Pearson family might disagree with me, or members of the Kozad family uh, might disagree with me. But John Kozad was here in the beehive, in the picture there. <clears throat> and he's sitting there talking to his mother, which was Gatewood. Al Pearson comes in, the conversation starts fairly pleasantly. And then it got angry. And John Kozad said to Al Pearson, there's a lady present and you can't talk like that in front of the lady. So they both walk out onto the front porch of this a beehive building. And there was at least one person, a little boy, who saw all of this happen as he came back to testify at the grand jury. John Kozad comes out, or Al Pearson comes out first. John Kozad follows him. And when they get onto the porch, um, Al Pearson punched uh, John Kozad in the face. And so, so powerful. And remember, he was a rancher, he used to deal with tough issues there. Um, knocked John Kozad down into a box. It was a shipping box. And so, if you can imagine, John Kozad's butt was in the bottom of this box, and his legs were sticking up at one end, and his arms were sticking out uh, of the other. Al Pearson was beating the crap out of John Kozad which was probably come up as to him because he was used to not being treated like that from most people. And he, he, he took uh, John Kozad by the throat uh, or by his jacket. And then 
and this is a story that came down, and I don't think this is true, but I'll tell it to you anyway. It's in Mary Sandoz's book. Um, Al Pearson said, it's the, it was alleged, that um, he was going to cut John Kozad's lying tongue out of his mouth. Now, that would make me nervous, too, I have to admit. And at that point, John Kozad pulled out a pistol, like it was over there, and shot him in the face, shot Al Pearson. There is no evidence of a knife in the grand jury testimony of any eyewitnesses. That did not come into my resentment. Book. And I mention that only because this is such an important part of the story in terms of people who today say, well, Al Pearson put a knife on John Kozak. And that just did not happen. Uh, we don't say. So <clears throat> you can see here in this graphic, John Kozak is stuck in this box. Al Pearson is beating the crap out of him. And John Kozak pulled out this pistol, the little pistol he carried in his jacket, and shot Al Pearson in the face. And it came up through his jaw and up into just below um, his brain. Um, somebody grabbed, and as of course he was pushed back by the, the fire of a pistol, and someone grabbed him, uh, Al Pearson, just to let, keep him. And then John Kozad got up from out of that box and went upstairs to uh, Teresa Kozad's or Mr. Julia Gatewood's apartment that was upstairs and cleaned himself up. Stopped, he was bleeding all over, uh, stopped some of the bleeding, and then left town immediately. Here are three other stories, though, that have come to my knowledge as I've been doing this research. And none of these show up in any of the other records, but they show up in people's commentary in the decades that followed the shooting. So one of those stories is that John Kozad did not shoot Al Pearson at the Beehive, but rather he went out to Pearson's house north of Kozad and shot his two sons in front of him. Did not happen. Another story is that Kozad shot and killed uh, Pearson's daughter, also not true. Um, and they, the other story that we found out that is really pretty interesting to me is that the shooting actually took place on the front porch of our museum. And Al Pearson was taken up the front stairs of our building and put for our library now, which is right next to where my office is, which is kind of weird, you know, if I decide that I want to believe that story, that's probably not a good thing to believe it because that happened right next to my office. Um, so those are three stories that are, I don't believe are true. And, and it's curious because the story about our museum bill comes from Delene Lewis, some of you may have had her as a kindergarten teacher in school. Um, and she knew a lot about the history of the building. And I'm a great believer that in stories like that, there's always an element of truth in something like that. There's a reason that that story has come down to us. I just don't believe it happened, but there's there's something to that that I do believe it. So the story gets muddied for me, purposely muddied. So one account is that David Claypool gave John Cole that a horse, and he rode off Kansas and caught a train and went to either Denver or the East Street. Another part of that story is that Teresa Kozad came out onto the porch, kissed her husband goodbye. His son, Robert, was standing there and bid them farewell and said, we'll meet somewhere else. And then John Kozad walked down to Kansas, or about halfway into down Nebraska, and then hopped on a wagon and went to Kansas from there. The Union Pacific went to Denver, went east as well, but so did the Burlington and Missouri uh, River Railroad. And he would have been well known on the Union Pacific Railroad. And as soon as he shot Pearson, uh, the call went to the sheriff and John Kozad decided to get out of town because he had remembered what had happened to Mitchell and Ketchum, two ranchers, but two homesteaders who were killed just a couple of years before. Um, there are different arguments again about where he went. I don't believe that he went to Colorado and he'll see why in a little bit because people would have known him in Denver. 
Denver was a metropolis, it was up and coming. Um, if he got onto the Burlington Railroad, no one really knew him in the same way that they did on, on the UP. And it's very interesting to me that family traditions, the Robert Henry family traditions, the second wife's sister, for example, um, really did not know about this story or knew about it in any detail. So it kind of eliminated her views as to what happened, because uh, she has some different views on what happened, and have gone back to what I think would have been more likely um, at that time period. Um, so he could have gone to Denver on the Burlington, Missouri. I really think what he did was he went to either Chicago or either Rosadale, Ohio, or mm -hmm. to New York City, where he could have that's where I think he went. Now, newspaper accounts in the weeks after the shooting said he was in South Dakota. Somebody saw him at the graveside in West Virginia, paid his respects. Somebody said they saw him in Chicago. Somebody said they saw him in St. Louis. The police did, or the, the law enforcement people of Nebraska, did try to track him down because we know they went to St. Louis. So he must have, there must have been somebody there that looked like him. Uh, or South Dakota, definitely South Dakota, but he had some uh, business interests as well. But this part of the story has been really always been big. And even to this moment, I don't think that any of us will ever know unless some diary comes up or some paperwork comes up, we'll really ever know. Because even within the family, they did not know. Where They just knew that for seven months after he shot out there, that he disappeared. Here, that's it. That's what the, the they knew. So Alf Pearson did that did not die immediately. Uh, he lived for about three weeks. Um, but on November 4th, 1882, just a couple weeks after the shooting, he dies. And some people, Kozat supporters, will make the argument that he lived from the gunshot for three weeks. That's not what killed him, it was bad medical care. And you can see that that argument as well. Um, and then there was an obituary in the paper, and he was buried um, by the Reverend C.S. Carr of the Ozad Methodist Church. And his he was buried in a little burying ground up at Little Buffalo Creek, or what's called the Reinhardt Cemetery, and it's about two miles west of where the uh, Pearson uh, farm was. And no marker was ever Place there except for this one here, and you can see the obituary there as well. Within days of his death, um, an inquest jury was conducted, and it was agreed by all those jurors that John was that A had shot Al Pearson, but that it was his bullet, the shooting of him, killed him. Um, and that was unanimously approved. And then two weeks later, on December 18th, the Nebraska governor put out a reward of $200 for the arrest and conviction of Kozad. And uh, if John Kozad had gone to Denver, as some suggested, he certainly would have left because now he could have been extradited from Colorado to back to um, Nebraska. And if he wanted to remain free and not probably get lynched, that was one of his own, uh, his own choice. <clears throat> but this is where the two biographers of Ben Rocky were both distinguished scholars, and I disagree. And I think it's because they did not spend a lot of time in Nebraska, did not spend a lot of time doing research in Nebraska records that I did, or in Colorado, um, any But So there's one other factor that figures into this that most historians have gotten wrong. And that is that just three weeks after Al Pearson dies. This other incident happened, also wrongly told by everybody since this happened. But on November 26, 1882, there's just weeks after um, he'd been shot, Pearson had shot and then died, John Cosa, Johnny Cosa, son, was arrested in what is now Lexington, then known as Plum Creek because he tried to burn down the, the Johnson House, which I think is number nine in that, in that picture. Johnny Kozad goes there, and he had friends in Lexington. His father was hated there, but he had friends. 
And John Johnny had created this bomb filled with kerosene and a wick. He placed all of this under a feather bed and had a long fuse and that he would have been long gone when the fire started. The fuse went out and so the room smelled like kerosene, of course. He's already on his way to Denver at that point and he's headed up to a really um, and the cleaning lady comes in, in the morning and smells this kerosene and realizes that all of the lamps on the second floor of this hotel have no oil in them. And that's because Johnny had taken all of that oil and put it into this, what really was a fire bomb, uh, to, uh, and, and to, um, with the idea that it would burn the place down. Had that happened, all of Lexington would have burned because it was a very windy day that day. And it just would have spread the fire. They were all wood frame buildings, and that would have been the end. Johnny Kozad now is on the train going to uh, up towards Greeley. And he, um, as he's going north, he, the, the police get on the train at North Platte, and he's in the uh, bathroom, so nobody knows where he is. Um, but he is then arrested at the LaSalle Junction. Colorado. And his bail is established $5,500. And he's charged with burning the building down. And that's how most people tell that story, that he burned the Johnson house, which is not what happened. He may have tried to burn it down, and he may have tried to set this fire bomb in place, but he did not burn the building down. Um, he's given a bail of $5,500. And um, at that time for Teresa Kozad, that would have been a, a, a pretty big amount of money to be uh, trying to raise because John Kozad is gone. Uh, wherever he is, he's gone. And even uh, now he sits in prison there uh, in Lexington, uh, waiting for the bail to be raised. And then once they do get the money, the sheriff refuses to let him go because he figures he's going to do just what his father did. And finally, that goes to the Nebraska Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court rules that they have to let go bail. But it was months later. And I mention that because in every account that you read of this episode of what happened, um, Traver David, Teresa's sister, is supposed to be laying in bushes near the prison, protecting and looking out for Johnny. But that couldn't have happened. He'd have been sitting in the bushes for three or four months. So that part of the story is, is not true. I mean, that's our problem with all of this. In fairness to Johnny, I mean, it was a stupid thing to try to burn the place down, but it did not burn the place down. And even though he was charged with that and disappeared and never came back to face the charges, you can almost understand why he would want to disappear because he was being charged with something he did not. And so he sat in what was then called the County Bastille or the County Jail. And uh, the town was almost, if, if that fire had taken off, it would have actually burned the whole town down. Uh, John Cosette Sr. was absolutely hated. And there was some feeling at that time that John Sr. had sent John Jr. to burn the whole town. Um, but all of this happened within a relatively close time between the shooting of Pierce and death of Pierce uh, this episode. So even now, we're not sure how the twists and turns went, but generally it's believed that the Kozats, John and Teresa, and Johnny Jr. wound up in New York City. Somehow they all found their way to wherever. They were probably communicating with uh, uh, a letter would be mailed on a train because that couldn't be traced. And then it would go to whomever and then it would pass through several hands and then wind up in John and Teresa's hands. But they're finally reunited in Atlantic City. Most of the biographers believe that happened in 1883. I'm going to be contrary and say that it happened late in the fall of 1884. Um, and it's at that time in late 1884, that Robert Henry Cosa now becomes Robert Earl Henry. So the change of name is done. John Cosa becomes Richard Lee. Teresa Cosa becomes, uh, becomes Pesley. And Johnny Cosa 
becomes Frank Southern, spelled without an E in the last name. And, and even he kept this myth alive until he died and said that he was born in Mexico, although he was born in Central. So the son's relationships to their parents uh, were changed as well. They became foster sons uh, and not their birth sons. And so uh, that essentially changed everything. They could disappear, which is what they did uh, in Atlantic uh, City. Uh, Richard Lee, or Johnny John Kozak, began, you can see what became known as Lee's Pavilion. And it was this huge bar. It had, uh, it had a 150-foot long bar, 10 bartenders. And when the city, and you can see this still, if you looked at a Google map of Atlantic City, New Jersey, you can see in this map on the right-hand side of Lee's Pavilion, the boardwalk is 40 feet wide. And to the, uh, to the right, or to the left, the boardwalk narrows down to 20. And the city of Atlantic City, because it was bustling and booming, wanted to make it 40 feet all the way down, but that would have cut right through the Lee's Pavilion and the bar and all the stuff that he was doing. If I was hiding from the law, I would think that you'd want to be a little low key. You know, you just kind of stay low, you know. That's why I moved to Nebraska. <laughs> yes. From New York, Central New York area. What does John Koza do? As soon as he threatens, he starts suing people. He erects at either side of the pavilion these big mounds of dirt, puts pipe on it with wheels that make it look like cannons. So if you were coming down from the what would be the northern part of the mountain city to the southern part, you would see what looked like two cannons facing. He also carried two six shooters on his belt on the outside of the jacket and a cowboy hat. I mean, like, I don't know. <laughs> you just think he'd want to say, you know what, let him have the land and we'll go for him. But that's not what he did. His son, Johnny, uh, now Frank, Dr. Frank Southern, became a councilman at the city. And finally, John Kozad sold this to somebody else and he disappeared and goes to the city. But that is kind of. The scent. I mean, he had all these real estate empires, creates all these challenges for himself. And, uh, and Lee's Pavilion is gone now. But if you looked at a Google map, you would still see how that uh, boardwalk still remains in the same dimensions. So that's the way things stood until 1894. So now we're 12 years after the death of uh, Al Pearson. And then and I can't prove this, but there's just too many coincidences. But on January 14, 1894, Harriet Pearson, Al Pearson's wife, dies. And she was living north of Kozad in her home. Both of the Kozad indictments, both Johnny and John, both of those indictments were still out. They could have been arrested anywhere as long as they were found. But then Harriet Pearson died. And maybe this has nothing to do with it, but I think it has everything to do with it. Because now she was dead. Maybe there was a sensibility to her feelings, um, maybe not. But now Traver Gatewood is able to get a grand jury together to question both of those indictments. And so from April to May of 1894, just three months after uh, Mrs. Pearson dies, the grand jury meets and ultimately, um, finds that uh, finds that both of the charges should be dropped, making the claim that it was self-defense. <clears throat> three pro-Pearson people testify, and three pro-Kozad people testify. And really curiously to me, when you read the grand jury testimony of all six of those people, they're all the same. I mean, it's pretty remarkable. It's not like somebody said, well, Al Pearson did this and the other person did that. Well, they all pretty much are identical in there. And, and as I say, they were three pro Pearson and three pro Kozad. They find now that, that John Kozad's indictment is dropped, as is Johnny Kozad's indictment. And so for a few months after that, John Kozad must have figured out about what he wanted to do next. And so, believe it or not, he came back to close out in November of 1894. And he comes back to 
re, um, reestablish himself here, all of his property had been sold. And he wanted to get, it had been really sold in the fire set because he only would, or Teresa would only accept gold. Mary Sandoz talks about the gold being sewn into their uh, shirts or their dresses and jackets. Um, and he was paid about 15,000, or he was paid 25 was paid to Astro and 15 was given to Stephen Hendy. That's how the Hendy name of our uh, museum came. And then John Cosette comes here, tries to gain this land back. Now it's 12 years after he has given the deed to Stephen Hendy and his partner. Uh, and everybody feels that that's a good deal and everyone walks away happy. Um, and the Kozad that John Kozad returned to was a very different place. New buildings were here now, the businesses were very active. There's a whole, that's a whole other story I could go into about why I think that was, but the Kozad that he returned, the one that he had found, he had found it, was a very different town in 1894 that was in the 1882 left. One of the most important things that had been done is that irrigation had been introduced to it. And that had happened in the summer of 1894. This is a major thing. I mean, a farmer's life is never easy, no matter what, but irrigation made it a whole lot easier and more, more of a possibility for farmers to survive as opposed to before that. Before the irrigation systems were built here in this part of the world, um, some farmers had cut ditches into the uh, Platte River, at, but they had to be right nearby. Their land needed to do that. And now they built this whole uh, network of systems that had changed for them. When John Kozak came here uh, in November of 1894, and this is again, I'm so tormented by whether to think this guy's a good guy or a bad guy. He decides to resell all the land that he sold or that Teresa sold in 1884. And he told all those people that he, he did this 19 times. He told all those people, I'm telling you, your title's no good. It's good now that I'm giving you a good title. One of the people that he did that to was Charles Allen. And that's the person who built the Fox Theater. And he had just gotten married. He's a young guy, white. They built a house. And John Cosette said, your title's not clear. I'll give you your title. So he, and this Charles Allen, young guy, walks into Teresa Gatewood's house, or Julia Gatewood's house. And all of a sudden, there's John Cosette standing there, the guy that everybody had heard about for 10, 12 years. So there are 19 of these deeds uh, that Cosette does. Now, you, you might say, well, you know, he was a good gambler. Um, but what happened next is that Stephen Hendy now turned around and sued John Kozak in federal court in Omaha. And the reason that happened in Omaha was because both John Kozak, now which is lady living in Iowa, and Stephen Hendy was from Illinois, they were both from different states. So that's why it went to court. And so it goes to court, and um, in this case, uh, in December of 1894, John Kozad, Robert Kozad, Traver Gatewood, William Claypool, David Claypool, all these guys are subpoenaed because they all had some role in those deeds. They had witnessed the deeds, or, or perhaps were people that the judge wanted to hear from. <clears throat> Six months later, the judge ruled in favor of Stephen Hendy and said John, John Kozak had no claim to any of those properties. If you live in Kozad and you have a property in Kozad home and you check your deed out, there's a paragraph in there by Judge Elmer Dunn. It's in every deed in Kozad that John Kozak sold that says that the property is rightfully Stephen Hendy's and he had a right to sell it. The Charges were dropped against Robert Kozad, and this becomes important in just a moment. But John Kozad never responded to the lawsuit, never showed up. And so, you know, Stephen Hendy really had, had a going on right from the very beginning because of that. I've often thought that it was the case of what I might call a gambler's bluff. 
that John Coza did that because he thought maybe he would get Stephen Henry to cough up some new money. Say, I'll give you $10,000 to make all this go away. Um, and that did not happen. Stephen Henry was wealthier than John Kozad had better players. And I think it was just a more important person than John Kozad was. But as I said earlier, if you check your deeds, for those of you who live in Kozad, you will find this paragraph in every deed that the Kozads uh, had some connection. So you might say, no, well, why is this important to Robert Henry Kozad or Robert Henry? This is all taking place at the time that Robert Henry is now becoming a very famous artist. And I can imagine uh, he going into court, uh, maybe because his father said, you gotta go to court with me and stick up for me to be a witness. And I could see a reporter who had just been in Chicago for some reason and saw Robert Henry's art on display saying, geez, I thought your name was Robert Henry, but you're Robert Kozak. The other thing that happened, and we just found this out recently, it's such a, re a remarkable thing. In 1895, just as this case is, is kind of winding down, being settled, Robert Henry has what I think is the first exhibition of his paintings in Nebraska, right at the same time that this court case is going on. And his, his um, paintings are on display in Lincoln. Um, he would come back in the years to come and regularly exhibit in Omaha, although he, it does not look like he came back to Nebraska, but at least. Uh, and so this painting that we own, the two paintings, the Carl Waldeck and the Beach, both of those paintings uh, came to be created at the time that some of this was going on. So it's, it was an important piece of all this. Two other COSADs did come back as well, I can join. Johnny, now Dr. Frank Southern, major doctor back in Philadelphia, and Teresa COSAD both came back to at least one or two occasions. Teresa stayed in what was known as Sam Schooley's house. This is right across from the Grand Generation Center, although at the time it was across from the city park. It was moved, uh, moved it down there to the East Man Royale. And then the beehive where uh, Julie Gateway's store was fell to progress, and the Stockton Bank was built there. And so Sometime I have to ask Phil Gardner if he ever has any ghosts running around there or anything, <laughs> you know. Uh, but that's so that building is gone. And then the telling of this story has changed in so many ways over the decades. Central to all of this is Son of the Gambling Man by Mary Sanders. So over the last few weeks, I've been reading through all of her papers and notes. When she was here in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s doing research for this book, she interviewed people. Some people were open to her, some were not. Sam Schooley, one of the main, uh, in, uh, or John Cosette's best friend, did talk to her. Um, but when she was writing her book and interviewing these people, she was already 50 years after the event. And people were talking about what had happened, but they had distant. Um, memory, I think. Um, however, that version, that book, is the version that most of you know the story. And I think that tonight, at the list, they will say, you know, there was more to the story. Um, one of the stories, uh, and one of the things that happened, is several months after John Kozad left, William Pearson, Alf's son, put a lien on all of the Kozad properties here in Kozad for the damages for having killed his father or shot his father. And the problem is, is the Kozads were very good about moving properties around. And by that point, when he became the executor of the estate and attached to the properties, the Kozads, John and Teresa, had already moved all the properties out of their names into the gateway names. So they, there was nothing to attach to. And there was some feeling that uh, Harriet Pearson got a $10,000 settlement when he sold the, uh, 
they have to when they have these bridges across. That's just not true. Um, but that's one of the layers of stories that people have um, been telling about. But I would say mainly because of Mary Sanders, and I'm not blaming her or critical of her. She was doing, a, she was a fabulous historian. Um, but I think that the people that she talked to uh, were all elderly, and I'm getting there, so I'm you know, a certain <laughs> age, right? So, and you know, if you were to say to me, Peter, what did you do 40 years ago? You'd have this kind of fuzzy feeling about what happened, and I think that's what happened to Mary Sanders, and she was the heard that John Kozak had shot Al Pearson's daughter. Never happened. Or that he shot uh, his her two or his two sons. Never happened. And so that's that's kind of the history of the history. But you can see why many of you had these different feelings about what happened to you because it maybe didn't happen uh, that way. In this effort to write this book, we have been uncovering a lot of new information that no one has seen. And one of the pieces of the story, and when I got here, I went with all the tour guides and listened to their stories so I could tell the story. One of them was that Teresa and Julia Gatewood stood on the porch of the beehive on the day that John Kozak was. And then ultimately, when Teresa left two or three months later, they cry and they say, we'll never see each other again and it's a terrible thing and blah, 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 blah. Well, that didn't happen. This document here is a census record from 1900 in Atlantic City. Julia Gatewood was living with her daughter. So the notion that there was this, you know, bitter and gnashing of teeth on the front porch of the behind just is not true. And so those are the kinds of things uh, that we're trying to clear up and to get to the point where people maybe can better understand, or maybe it'll be more confused about the year before that we started. Um, but that's, I mention that only because, in my, even as I said before, my own feeling about John was that even at this late date, this moment, still is conflicted because of all these other pieces. And when you take the murder or the shooting, of, as you call it, the shooting of Donald Pearson out of the picture, that makes it even more difficult. Um, if you're a Pearson family member, you're going to say he absolutely killed and was that, and we we even have Pearson members come to the museum and say uh, John Kozat assassinated uh, Al Pearson. Um, so even at this late date, uh, that's happened even in my my time. So with that, I thank Mike for his use of the pictures, um, and we've got some other names of people who have helped us. Um, but the Dawson County Historical Society has helped us with this as well. Um, but I'm hoping if I didn't, I'm hoping I made it more clear for you, but I suspect that I'm leaving you more confused than when you came in here. So anyway, but I'll take any questions. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, what about the people? Al Pearson? No. Kozad. John Kozad was born in a town in Ohio called Allensville. In Ohio. In Ohio, yes. Yeah. And when he was, so his mother died when he was a young boy. His father, father got married actually four times. And so there are sets of children from four different wives. But when his uh, mother died, uh, his father Henry got remarried. And that stepmother to John, and he did not get along with one day John's message, and he left and went to Cincinnati, he began to, to uh, get on the riverboats, and that's where he learned how to camp. So. Uh, my granddad came here in 1882 mm -hmm. from Pennsylvania, who actually moved to the Republic of Now, I've got a lot of connections about him. Now, his name is John Jackson Kozak. Yes. Uh, and uh, did you know that he was actually Stonewall Jackson? I, you know, it's funny that you say that because I just tried to track that rumor down, not rumor, that piece of information. I'm sorry. And I cannot, Mary Sandoz wrote quite a bit about it, but I have not been able to say with any definitive way that that is what happened. I've heard that, 
Mary Sandoz wrote that. But I have not been able to prove that. I did some research into Stonewall Jackson, and I think it's through the wife, or the lady, actually, John Stonewall Jackson's wife, that is where I think that Mary Sandoz and others have said that he was born of himself. You see, his childhood and Abraham Lincoln were almost identical. They were interchangeable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he lived in that part of Virginia. Right, that became West Virginia. That's right. Well, this comes from a history that I read mm-hmm. called Stonewall and Ballot. Mm-hmm. This campaign in 1861 and Now, if that is true, this town has a direct connection to right. George Kent Patton Jr. That's right. Because he was Stonewall Jackson's training officer. He was training mm-hmm. He basically had rebels. In 90 days, he was killed in the Battle of Winchester. Which is a lot of more times than the land of the And it, it was we were killed about the Winchester in the spring of 1862. And anyway, uh, there are stories that I have read that there were certain varieties of people in England that the British just simply did not. Uh, the companion story this fellow is a uh, very liberal. Uh, Darling, he's always at the Democratic National Committee uh, convention. He was looking for the uh, president of the General Motors back in the early 80s. Uh, he won, and he claims to be Irish. So his family, if ever watched the play about losing your roof on TV, they traced his family back. His family fought in a war against the British and lost. And what they did was that it was always indentured service. A lot of people from the United States were a good service. And you would find people by the name of Freeman, but they can only go back so far because their name was lost. Mm-hmm. And some of them was actually kidnapped. But anyway, this fellow was sold, his ancestors sold his option in London to pay off the war debt. And he was sold off to of Massachusetts. <laughs> but the story I write about, it, there are certain varieties. You ever heard of people by the name of Wallace? No. Wallace, the vice president. Of oh, Wallace, Henry Wallace. Yeah. 